Welcome to our panel tonight. I am very excited that everyone's here. Uh, can, can everyone hear me okay? Anyone downstairs wants to come up? Come up! We're having a we're having a panel with um, fantastic authors. So come on up, and we're going to be talking about um, starting the summer slide, the reading slide today with these amazing authors. So um, to start out, I'm going to we're going to do some introductions. My name is Samantha M. Clark. I am the author of the book the, the Boy, the Boat, and the Beast, which comes out on Tuesday. Yay! And I'm going to ask these fantastic, I'm going to be moderating the evening tonight, but I'm going to ask these fantastic authors here to uh, very quickly introduce themselves and their books to you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is John Zelaitis, and uh, my book is not out yet. This is a special advanced edition. It's called The Seven Torments of Amy and Craig. Um, am I talking about the book at this point? Yeah, just... can you make a one line? Um, and it's, uh, this is a book about a high school couple that breaks up seven times in one year, and it's told out of chronological order, and it takes place in 1994, before cell phones. Oh. <laughs> It's okay, I can just talk really loud. I don't like microphones anymore. Can you guys see her okay? Yeah. Hi, I'm Vicky. Um, this is my book, How to Breathe Underwater. It comes out in August, so August 14th. And um, it's about Kate, who is a competitive swimmer. And she moves because her parents get divorced, and she decides to quit swimming, and it kind of blows up her face. Um, and this is actually, I'm giving this one away tonight, and we're going to ask a question later for someone. Stand up because I get out of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> also, I've been on a very long plane journey, as you can hear from my accent. Can you hear me over there? It's a little. here, okay. yes. So I've come from Australia, and my mum is my bum is numb. <laughs> but I've also been on a road trip from LA to here, so it's another lots of lots of silly. So sorry, I've got to stand up and talk. So my book is The Harper Effect. It came out last month in America, and it's in the world of professional tennis. And as a one-liner, it's a comeback story, it's uplifting, it's inspiring. It's about a 16-year-old girl who's given her whole life, 10 years, to tennis, and suddenly it's all taken away from her. What is she going to do? Who is she going to be? Um, how is she going to solve this problem and, and get up from being knocked down so hard? <laughs> I'm Joe Whittemore, and I write girl books. These are based on the CW television show, so it takes place at characters and the world of the show, and there's original stories, and they're Warner Brothers approved. So the first one, which is the one on the right, is Kara um, and Friends start encountering regular citizens that suddenly develop superpowers, and so they have to figure out what is in the powers. And then the book on the left is the DEO team gets cursed, the entire city actually, the natural city gets cursed, and they get sent back to a facsimile of ancient Rome, and so they have to figure out how to break the curse and get back to the future. TM. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still making fun of teachers, and that's what I do for a living. 
and Don is also a playwright, and he writes plays for high school. There's all of these plays here. So he's quite well known in the uh, in that, in that realm. And Vicky? Um, well, I don't remember a time when I didn't want to write, honestly. Um, but literature is like the only thing that's ever held my interest. Like, I don't care about like anything else. So that's, I like write because that's the only thing that I really very good. I love it. Very good. And Taryn? Yeah, well, um, I, I sometimes, I think I blame it on not having TV until I was six. Then it was just, there were books and there were pens, and you read books and you, you wrote with the pens. That's what I did with my life for a long, long time. And it was always, I was going to write books, and the life got in the way, and it took a bit long, but I'm going to, yeah, love it. And, and, and I think you know, when we talk about the summer slide later, I think that's going to come into it somewhere. So, and Joe, what, what Yeah, you um, I've been writing since, not well, but since I was a small <laughs> child. And I just kind of, I went from writing for my small paper in college to learning that regular people can actually be authors and write books. And that's when I decided to pursue writing as an actor. My story is really different. I didn't start writing when I was little. Uh, I actually started writing because I, I have a niece who is a teenager, and when she was in high school, she didn't have any friends that wanted to read books with her, and so she's like, Auntie, read these books with me. And I was like, okay, sure, just tell me what to buy. And so we started our own little book club, and we would talk about books, and it was almost fun, and then she would call me bawling after the finishing of one of her favorite series, and someone dies, and I'm not gonna tell you who. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I'll write you a book. And so I did, and this is her book. It's dedicated to her. The, the main character is named after her, and so that's kind of how it happened for me. And while I was doing this project for her, I realized how much I really, really loved writing, and I didn't really realize it. I always told myself stories in my head, but never really put it to paper until this. And I don't know, it kind of just stuck. It was just, I finally, like, the light clicked for me. So, that's my story. See, I love that because, you know, we're, 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 talk we're here talking about keeping kids reading, and so often, you know, we, we, you know, kids think that they have to read, you know, if they're not reading by the times they're teens, or if they're not, if they stopped reading when they were younger, that, you know, they're not going to pick it up when they're teens. But people can pick this up whenever, it doesn't matter how old they are. So, that's fantastic. And um, so, was there a particular book? that changed your life in some way, or have books in general changed your life? Now, for, for um, I think part of that was, was answered already, but was there any particular book that really kind of hit you in some way and just pulled you in and that was it? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, anyone. Go on, Vicky. Because the one that all I always think of is uh, All American Girl by Meg Cabot. Like, if you haven't read it, it's amazing. Um, it's about a girl who is just like living her normal life and then saves the president from an assassination attempt and then falls in love with his son. And it's like the best thing ever. And when I was 13, it was the first YA contemporary I ever read. And I had like, I was in AP classes, so we read like Shakespeare and Dickens, and like I was reading Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and like, like high profile stuff. And then I read All American Girl, and it was like, oh my gosh, like it's just a book about a normal girl, and it's funny, and like, I was like, I can write books like this, like, I can't write like Shakespeare, but I can write like this, and like, so that was kind of like, yeah. And that really goes to show that finding that right book for you, you know, as, as a reader is really important. Anybody else, a book that really, like, pulled you in, changed your life in some way? I think he probably uh, Mary Poppins, but Neil Travers. Oh yes. Yeah, and, and it's like, so yeah. different from the movie. Like there's a nanny that snaps off her fingers and because they're different flavors, they did different flavors, and so she snaps off her fingers and gives it to the baby. Because they were actually there was this Jane and Michael that were also twins that were younger than them, like babies. And so you get to learn about that, and there's just all these different adventures. I mean, they still had some of the same adventures with the uncle or whatever that floated up on the roof. And then, you know, jumping those paintings, but they had all these other adventures and also the like, Pleiades, and yeah. all these different things. There was all this amazing, fantastical stuff. And so I think that was probably the biggest for me that just to explore all these new worlds. Yeah, yeah. For me, too, those kind of books, you know, I mean, I grew up in England, and those kind of, I mean, British. British kids 
it at that time, you know, was really out there. But <laughs> no, I think it was. But but it really did. It, it really pulled you in. Anybody else? Any of this book that really pulled you in? Well, I think for me it was like the Mortal Instruments series. I know that sounds yeah. like yeah. but um, that was a really what started my nieces and I, like our little fan club and how we started reading books. And we actually read one out loud. She read it out loud to me as we drove and I moved from Florida to Texas. And so she sat in the front seat and she came with us and she was just reading out loud and she would finish like, I'm like, are you going to stop? Like, you can't stop. <laughs> like, keep going. And so that was really a really special time for us together. I had um, I had this illustrated Hobbit, oh, no. and I've had its own record. This is a long time ago now. So you play the record while you're reading the book, and I read that book so much that that eventually all the pages fell out, and my dad had to like punch new holes in the book and like made like sort of a clipboard of it. So that was that was probably the book I read the most. That's awesome. Do you still have that book? I think it's probably still in my parents' house somewhere. Oh, that's fantastic. You've got to keep that. Take it around, you know. Show, show it, it is well loved. It's <laughs> back, you know. Yes. So records now. That's right. That's right, yeah. And Taryn, anyone that yeah, really no. pulled you in? For me, it was like, if I took young, yeah. it was every book I read. Like, I read read The Magic Faraway Tree, I wanted to be Moonface. I read Nancy Drew, I wanted to be Nancy Drew. And I think that was the beauty of books, is that I could just escape into them and, and love them and be them and exist in their worlds. But one book in particular, I know it's a movie now, but it was a book, is um, Charity of Fire. Oh, yes, yes. Because I just love that aspiring for a goal and dream and that run around the quadrangle, that scene was in my head for years and years and I was a runner. Um, I used to um, train in the and it was a big part of my life. So when we were going to move to England, which I had a spin in England, it was like, yes, I'm going to Oxford, I'm going to run around that quadrangle, that's my thing. <laughs> So it, I think it's inspiring things, things that inspire and motivate those sort of books. Yeah, like yeah. those are the main things for me. Yeah. You find those characters that, that you know kind of become part of your life and that you can identify with. So um, so that will then bring us in. These are books that, that kind of kept us reading. So that brings us into let's talk about the summer slide. Taryn, what is the okay. summer slide? And you know. Yeah, there's lots of talk, you know, stop the summer slide. It's like, what the hell is that? It sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's, it's it, um, in the summer, obviously, the kids have got, I don't know, eight, nine weeks off, and they're not in any sort of routine. They're not going to school to read. Maybe in school term, they read at night before they go to bed, but in the school holidays, they're out and about. They're at their friend's house. They're at the club, the mall. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they're not, they get out of their routine, so they don't read as much, and therefore their reading skills that they've picked up and improved over the school year are suddenly starts to slide all the way back. So that when they start the school year, they're kind of starting back from where they were, and so that advancement is stalled. So the idea of being to stop the summer slide is to get kids reading every day, even just for a short period of time. And so I think some of us are going to talk about how um, you can stop the summer slide, but one of the things um, that I believe very strongly in is something um, it's called the summer reader thought, because it gives you a goal. I like goals. <laughs> it gives you a goal. You go onto a website and you register to read at least 20 minutes a day through the whole of summer, and you get a, your own website page. Um, it's run by every library, who are not for profit, so it's all very carefully, cleverly done and very beautifully done. So you get your own page with your picture and you can put in the minutes that you read every day. You send your link off to your relatives and your friends and ask them to sponsor you to read. So for every minute you're reading, you're raising funds and the funds are going to save our libraries. So to me, it's a great cause. It's also getting kids into the habit of reading. It's about habit, picking up that book for 20 minutes every day. And apparently, I'm told by every library that for kids who read for just 20 minutes every day of the year, them into the 19th percentile for reading achievement and literacy. And given that uh, America is uh, 16th out of 23 countries in terms of literacy, number one being where you want to be, number 23, no. Um, I think it's really important just to get our kids into the house. Where's Australia? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
thought you would know that. <laughs> she didn't have TV till she was seven, so you know. <laughs> yeah, we had number one and a half. <laughs> anyway, so that is the summer slide, and that's one of the secrets, as I believe, is just to get into that habit and to have that goal and putting in the numbers. Kids love doing that. Going on the website, putting the numbers that they've read, see how much money they're raising. Oh, and by the way, they can win. Amazon vouchers up to like 500 bucks, wow. and they can also win an e-reader. So it's, it's everyone wins. Yeah, definitely. And the website for that? Oh, I'm sorry, the website. I do have little slips I can hand out later, but it's readforlibraries.org slash joy, as in joy. But I've got some slips I can give you later if you want to come on. Great. And I remember reading an article about the summer slide um, a few years ago, actually. But, um, you know, we, we always think that reading comprehension is so important for reading, but Warren Buffett, um, Bill Gates, you know, some of the biggest innovators of our time credit that innovation and their success with reading, because it doesn't just help with reading in English, it helps with everything. You know, I mean, Einstein has that very famous quote, you want your kid to be smart, you know, let them read fairy tales. You want them to be a genius, let them read more fairy tales. Because, you know, reading promotes more um, imagination, it promotes that innovation, it promotes trying, it promotes confidence, everything. So it really is really important. So now, now you know, we're all authors here, we're all really busy. So how do you guys um, keep reading in your schedule? Many authors you might not know have day jobs as well as writing and doing these events. So how do you keep manage to keep reading in your schedules and what kind of tips do you have for keeping kids as well as the, the reading goals? Anyone? What, Joe? Joe, you start. Yeah, um, I read for bedtime. It's kind of like a way to wind down because there's so much going on during the day. I don't know, I don't, I don't give a lot of time to read during the day and then right before bed, you know, you shouldn't be watching the TV because if you watch the news, you'll be sad. Yeah. <laughs> now. Let's all not watch the news and read the books and stuff. Right. So, yeah, so if you're reading some books, you know, wind down a little bit and then drift off to sleep with the, the, you know, quite, maybe not horror novels before you go to bed, <laughs> but you know, just something light and fun and just enjoyable for you, whatever your fancy and romance, western, what have you. And yeah, I mean that's that's when I do it. Is it? Then I can fall asleep easier. That's great. Anyone else? Any? You know, when when, Taryn, when do you find time for reading? Um, do you have a TV now? I'm guessing. Yes, I have a TV. <laughs> I go turn it on though. That's the secret. That's the, that's the key. <laughs> see? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I keep constantly people say to me, "Have you seen the Game of Thrones?" And I'm like, "No." Have you seen? Have you seen? I don't, I don't have to do that. Yeah. That's how I find more time to read. I've always read an hour before bed or whatever. But then I was like, my TBR, sorry, to be read to Ohio, it was like, it was higher than my mind. And I was like, I need more time to read. And so I just gave up TV. I seriously, like, for late. It yeah. <laughs> just went on for a few years. And so I could read two, three hours a night. And I much prefer it. But that's not really, I don't think, a solution for kids. Yeah. To say, give up TV, it's not going to work. It yeah. works for me because that's my life and that's what I love. But for kids, I think we need to be more inventive, like doing things like the summer reading book. But um, I think also it's convincing them the benefits of the book, like how books can change your life. Books can be an escape. Books can teach you things. Books can inspire you. Books can um, entertain you. And, you know, all of those things. But you have to find the book for each child. For one child, it's going to be one thing, and for another, it's completely different again. So it's finding that book and yeah. pushing that for each child. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Like, my little one is here today. Hello. <laughs> and he I loves nonfiction. That is his jam. Like, he loves nonfiction. And so I'm not going to sit there and try to force him to read something that he doesn't want to read. I think it's really important to allow children just to pick their books, whether that be a graphic novel or nonfiction or Harry Potter or whatever it is. You know, just letting them say, here are your choices, which one is your favorite, and then allowing them to read it. I think I think that really helps out. And, and just We'll, we'll, we'll go to the go to you guys just in one second also. But you mentioned graphic novels. 
um, but comic books as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there, there's always this theory, you know, a comic books really reading. But yes, yeah. they are. There's a, a great way. That, you know, comic books. I always think are kind of like the gateway drug to, to novels and to reading. <laughs> 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 because it is. It's stories, and even movies. Movies are, are stories, and video games are stories, and books are stories. And if they can find those stories, if you get hooked on stories. It doesn't matter how you get those stories, where you get those stories from. And a lot of video games have books out now, too. That's like right. Minecraft books yes. and everything else. Yeah. They all have their own series. So if your kid really loves Minecraft, oh, yeah. Right, I was just about to say, yeah. I mean, TV shows, right. So getting, if kids really love the, the when, well, not if, the kids who really love the Supergirl series, you know, getting them the, the books yeah, too, you know, you know, saying, and then if they love sports, getting them a hopper, you know, and, and how to breathe underwater, getting them those things, the books that are connecting those books with the topics that they really love. Now, what about you guys? Any tips for things that you do or don't things that you get do with your kids to get uh, their kids to read? Well, I was going to say that I turned a book apart, so, that, so that's how I, you know, force, I don't have to force myself, but how I, how I propel myself to read different books. Um, my I, I have two kids and they, they just read constantly. Um, my son, he's uh, 10 and he got the Warriors, which is a really gateway drug if you've ever seen. There's an entire shelf downstairs of cat books. Um, <laughs> the Warriors is a series about all cats and there's 42 of them um, and he's on book 33 now. So like it's just that. So, um, and then, you know, we limited screen time, so that helped. But really, just let them pick whatever they want. Um, and try not to be like, you know, the National Geographic facts book doesn't count. Um, I actually kind of don't have a problem finding time to read. I feel like all I do is read. I've always got my notes in books. But kind of my secret, like when I was in college and had like zero time to read, was audiobooks. Like, I wish somebody had introduced me to audiobooks when I was in high school because like when I'm driving, when I'm doing dishes, when I'm running, like I'm always listening to a book. Um, but as a kid, I don't remember like, being able to have the attention span for audiobooks. But I think that Anne had it right and that like, you should read with a kid, like read what they want to read. Because when I was younger, I was reading everything my sister was reading. Because when we were done, we were going to fangirl over <laughs> Harry Potter and all that stuff. And so it was like, read like you want somebody to read with because then you can have things to talk about. So I think that's uh, that's the secret is reading with them. And a lot of libraries have book clubs that, that um, kids can read, you know, together and as, as well, right? Yeah. I know that, I know that, that ours does. I also love one of books. I think they're amazing. I you know, use them all the time. And I think they're a really good way to get into. So now, um, as authors, so we are authors that write for kids and teens. Um, so are there books that you guys are really looking forward to that are coming up in this summer or this year? And, um, or that you know, your kids are looking forward to, ones that you would love to recommend? What books that uh, you're thinking, you know, that could be kind of drawing people, drawing teens in? Um, there's one that I want to read called The Undead Girl Game. Oh, that, that sounds good. Really, I like books that are funny um, yeah. and that have sort of a fun idea behind them. That book's about three girls that get brought back from the dead. <laughs> um, and that looks like, it looks like a blast. So that looks like a, like a fun vacation book. Yeah. Anyone else got any? Books? I want to read Dawn's book. Right? <laughs> yes. Oh my god. I, I tried to fight him for that book outside, and it didn't go down well. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've read it; it's very good. So everyone, it comes out October second, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's not the second. No, not oh, the summer. Not the sale. Yes. After the summer. Yeah, yeah. Although here in Austin, it will still be the summer October. Yes, it will be. Yeah, we've got a, a boy team. It's a great. It's hard to find boy perspectives in my life that are contemporary and not fantasy or, you know, going out and chasing, you know, chasing the monsters. So it gets inside the head of a boy, which I think And boys fun. and romance, too. And romance, You know, yeah. love and boys and friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. your book, I mean, 
I don't like to recommend books I haven't read, but I have read these before <laughs> in the e version. And so, send your books out next week. Yes, on Tuesday. So mine's, mine's actually for a slightly middle, younger girl. Yeah, mine's middle grade. It's for, it's for um, 8 to 14. So this is like really unusual because the very first scene is this boy shipwrecked on an island and he doesn't know where he is or who he is. And it's like, right, where's this guy? So, it's a cool book. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad <laughs> Anyone else got any books that they're like dying to get their hands on this, this year or things that you're reading now? time when parents just abandoned their children. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I would just stay there in the bookstore like the whole time. So like I yeah, I just I love bookstores. Yeah. When I was a kid, like um, we didn't we had a TV but we didn't have cable so it was like I could watch Jerry Springer or soap operas, like that was my option. Um, and so our library was like six blocks away from my house. So I walked there all the time, ride my bike whatever. I was always there. And like even now like the library in my new neighborhood is right across the street, and I'm there more than I'm at my house. But there's something so comforting about getting a book off of the shelf and like sitting down at the private library and like reading. Like it feels like home to me. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. Which I love, like you know how bookstores nowadays, you know, they've got all these couches. You know, you can just sit and relax. You know, they, they didn't have that as much when I was growing up. I'm really glad that they have those now. Well, what about you guys? Um, well, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know, bookstores and libraries have kind of an equal thing for me, and it was like they just held all these secrets that I needed to really know, and they were inside these beautiful books. But it was all very tactile as well, like I would always run my hands along the spines of the books. <laughs> And in a new bookstore, it was the shininess and the brightness. But in a library, it was who else's 
touch this book and I start to imagine um, who had read it before me. It was, there was just so much mystery around the book, inside and outside and all around it. And then, of course, there's book sniffing, right? Yes. I mean, seriously, it's there's new books. books. Yeah. There's really old books. <laughs> <laughs> this one's been to the pool. <laughs> I mean, I'm a major book sniffer. Even to this day, I look around and the first thing I did was... <laughs> I don't know why, I just, it's lovely, it makes me feel great, I love this one, but that's, yeah. that is it for me, libraries are a bit more tactile and in that, that kind of mystery thing. Yeah. So, when I was a kid, uh, Santa Barbara, California, and we had uh, a library, a library, that if you read a certain amount of books and you could describe the books to the librarians and you knew that you just read them, <laughs> then you would get a free ticket to the zoo.
writing books for kids um, at the Barnes & Noble, oddly enough, on Brody Lane, because my favorite author carried books, a fantasy author. He was, uh, and he's going to be in town. He's yeah. in town. Oh, that's right. He's here tonight. I know. We were missing him. Very. Here. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> 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 anyway, so he was speaking about how when he first started writing, he practiced law during the day, and he would write at night. And I was in the phone. This, this guy is a normal person. That's when I was talking earlier about how normal people become authors. And so, you know, I was asking him questions about his writing process. He's like, look at me talking to you like you're one of my students. I was like, girl, oh, I could write? Okay. And so ever since then, after that, I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write. So it was because of an event where an author was willing to share. Okay. So I'm telling you, if you want to write a book, you only write a book. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's another reason why author visits are so amazingly important and taking kids to see authors. Because I was the same way, you know, growing up, I thought, oh, special people did those, you know. I could never write a book, and yet, oh, so there you go, you know, it, it can happen, and it does happen, just to, to ordinary people as well, so, yeah, I think meeting people, and I always, you know, in, in Austin, um, I'm the head of the Austin chapter of the Society of Children and Writers and Illustrators, and we have over 90 published children's book authors just living in Austin, so there, if you think about it, that's people who are going to the same dentist as you, who are shopping at the same grocery stores as you, and they're writing these books and publishing these books from you know major publishing um, houses, and it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, for myself, you know, W. H. Smith in England was one of my favorite bookstores when I was growing up, and seeing my book on sale at whsmith.co.uk one day, I actually. I, I found it completely by accident, and it was the best day ever. <laughs> yes, yeah, I did. I'm like, oh my god, I have my book, yes. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, okay, so uh, let's open it up, see if anyone here has any questions. I've got more, but I want to see if you guys have any questions before I keep nattering on. Does anyone have any questions for anybody here? Anybody? Yes. So how did you guys feel when you found out you were first going to get published? I mean, were you, were you nervous or scared? Or how, did, how did that happen? That's that's a very good question. Anyone want to take this one first? I, Joe? yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Uh, well, I was very excited. I was at work, and so I made the side off the screen a little. But I, <laughs> I started doing the thing, and anybody who writes does this thing for themselves. They're like, you know what? All I need is to be published. Published. All I need is a good marketing campaign, and then set. Maybe you get a good marketing. Campaign. All I need is to make a list, and then set. <laughs> maybe you make a book list. All I need is to win an award, and then and it's just you. And so it's just it's it's always you're trying to one up yourself, which is great because you should always be challenging yourself. But just forewarning, you're not going to be happy just being published. You're gonna <laughs> once you get published, you're gonna want that next thing, and that's awesome. And you should always be trying to think of the next thing. Yeah. For me, um, it had been such a, a long dream, and uh, like anybody would when you get good news on the phone, of course, I just put the phone down and jumped around and screamed and threw my hands in the air and thought, who can I phone? And phone 10 people and had to choose who to go and celebrate with, which was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the one thing that was unexpected was on the day of publication, when I realised my book was out on shelves, was I was terrified because now there's no taking it back. It was out there. We're going to see what I felt and thought. And, and it's a little piece of you. It's a little piece of your soul that you put in that book. <laughs> it really is a little piece of your soul. So yeah, terrifying is the next word. <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about that journey, Vicky? Well, I have kind of like an unconventional route because Swoon Reads works a little bit than other places. Um, so it's I used to call it like the American Idol of publishing. Um, <laughs> so you submit to Swoon and then they the people who comment some readings and stuff and then they choose people every season to um, to publish. And so like that I knew that there was all, there's like a tiny little possibility. And so of course every day I'm like checking my email, checking my check. 
And then the one day that I didn't check my email, I was like, oh, I got to like work on cleaning my house today. And so my husband took the day off and we're like scrubbing the floors and stuff. And then I was like, oh man, I'm gonna order some pizza. I'm like, let me check my email and see if I have a coupon. And it was like, you know, right there. And I was like, <laughs> Like the one day I didn't check my email, and then like they were like, "Hey, we want to call you." And my, I swear, I've never talked to my editor on the phone other than this one time because I made such a fool of myself, like heavy breathing. And I, she was like, "Hey, we want to offer you a book deal." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so she just emails me now. <laughs> well, this is. Uh, it's the fifth novel I wrote in the first four in itself, so it yeah. took five years. Um, I wrote a lot of plays, but um, this is my first novel that I got published. And uh, it was, yeah, it was really exciting. I remember I was walking around, I was at a Starbucks, as usual, and I, was, <laughs> I just started walking around outside the building, um, like on the phone, learning about it. Um, and the ironic thing is, um, so Disney is publishing my book, and I made fun of them relentlessly in the plays <laughs> to the point where I have like I have scenes where lawyers come in and say we can't say that because Disney's gonna sue us and then so then now they know who I am. <laughs> so, it was sort of a like oh yay oh no <laughs> mine is a little untraditional as well. Like I uh, entered a contest so for a romance writer of America there is romance in my story of course and I ended up winning contest and while I was at a conference where I got this amazing win which was very exciting and I got to go up on stage and get an award and it was really exciting. Uh, I met the editor at a table and we just kind of really hit it off and then about a month later I got an email saying oh yeah we're going to take your book to acquisitions and then it just happened. So that's pretty much it. So I think there's no really, as you can tell, there's no one way to get a book published by any means. Yeah, yeah. Mine was also, I had written many, many novels before. My, this book is, is my, my debut novel. I was a journalist for years before, and um, it was the third novel that I had, it was the third novel I wrote. By the time I signed with my agent, I had written five and a half novels. And um, when this one sold, I was actually, the day that I got the call from my agent, I was actually, I had promised myself that by the end of January, I was going to have a revision of a YA um, into her. And I was, I, I, had, I had been like barely sleeping, barely sharing, but we won't talk about that. But I just was so into this revision, trying to get it done. I wasn't even checking emails. You know, I knew that the, the book had been on submission for over a year. And um, it's it's a it's a different kind of story, as Taryn said. So you know, it, it's um, it, it was a it took a while for it to find its home. And I remember I was I was so into getting this revision in, and then my my agent called, and she never calls. So I was like kind of annoyed at first, like I'm trying to get this thing in. What does she want? So then she calls, and then I find out that we've actually got two offers on the table. So then we had to choose. So it was very, very exciting. And then I remember calling some friends, including one who's in the room, Donna. And Donna, who's sitting uh, in, in the back there, said to me, she's like, so what are you going to do today? How are you going to celebrate? And I said, well, I need to get this revision done. She's like, Sam, you can take the day off and just, you know, celebrate, have fun. I said, no, I want to get this revision done. <laughs> so I got the revision done. <laughs> I celebrated by writing more, but it was really, really surreal, and I don't think it really sunk in uh, for a very long time. And it doesn't really sink in that it's going to be actually on bookshelf on Tuesday. It, right now, it, that's still an unreal thing, and I'm still expecting Simon and Schuster any day to be like, "Oh, sorry, we were kidding. It wasn't that book, you know?" <laughs> um, anyone else have any other questions? How do you find inspiration for what you write? Ooh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Anyone want to? Where do you not find inspiration? Right. I don't know about any of, of you all, but I have like on my phone, I keep a notes section where I have like book ideas, and it's like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And I, I mean, anything randomly will just give me like this. It's, I, I consider writing like a seed. Like, so you get this little seed, this little idea, and then you plant it, and then you kind of just watch it grow and see where it goes from there. So I. 
get ideas from everywhere, sitting in the car, listening to the radio. Uh, Eugenica came from a, an electricity ad that I saw of the home of the future. And I was like, well, what if the future was now? So I created this entire other dimension that has the main, most amazing technology ever. So, uh, I don't know. Everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny because you say, what if? Yeah. And that's pretty much how I start the story ideas. I always say, what if this? You know, what if suddenly you had, the superhero wasn't the only superhero in town, there was a bunch of big superheroes. What if people suddenly were sent back to a different time? So I, 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 I built all these what ifs, and I was like, is that enough for an entire story, or is that just, you know, what if snails had wheels? That's not a story, that's just gross. So I don't know what to, you know, I don't know what to talk, I don't know what to actually embellish on and, and extrapolate on and grow. And I'm going to come to you guys in a minute, but, but Joe, with yours specifically, now this is coming from a show, so are they giving you ideas as well? Are you going to them with ideas? Yeah, so before um, I was able to write these, I had to go to Warner Brothers with outlines for all three books of what I wanted to do, because of course I was writing um, in tandem with the show. So I couldn't write something, there were some rules, you know, you can't talk about Fight Club. And there was a, <laughs> um, so a couple rules where I couldn't do anything that would change what was going to happen on the show. So I couldn't break up any couples, I couldn't create any new couples, I couldn't kill anybody off. And I couldn't introduce characters that were going to conflict with the characters they were going to introduce in the show. So that's why they wanted the outlines for each book. And we decided to go with an arc where it was um, ancient civilizations, pretty good ancient civilizations. So this one has um, Atlantis, this one has ancient Rome, the next one will have the Aztecs. And then I send them all my ideas, they approve them, I write the books, and then the manuscripts go back to Warner Brothers, and then Warner Brothers, you know, marks off stuff, they say, you know, it's you can't use this particular character because you're actually going to be a hero in the next episode of the show, you know, something like that. So. And, and Joe has books that um, are not part of the show, that are not branded as well, that, that you know, where she completely does the story herself as well. And I'm assuming that was a very different part of the process. It is. I, I like how easy it is to have the characters in the world already set up for me, but it also is a little bit limiting because I can't give Supergirl powers she doesn't have, you know, or I can't that's something, and I can't go, well, let's not go to Vegas, because now everything has to take place in the world of National City, because that's where their base is. So it's it's fun, but it's also challenging to, to write within a strict sense. Yeah. And what about you guys, Taryn? Um, for me, uh, it's mostly people that make me go, what if, or how did that happen, or what is that person thinking, or... So I'll give you an example. The book before this, which hopefully will get published, um, is based on a 16-year-old girl who solo sails the Pacific. Um, so it came from, obviously, there are 16-year-old girls who have solo sailed the world. And it just intrigued me, and I get completely down the rabbit hole of that girl, and I read about them, and I'm working their blogs, and I'm thinking, what came before? What made that girl? What did it feel like? Why, why was she there? What was the point? And then the story comes from there, the fictional story. Um, in the case of the Harper Effect, my brother was a professional tennis coach and player, and at some point in his career, he coached Annalie Moresmo, who went on to become the world number one player in the women's professional tennis league. So I met her when she was 16, about to turn pro, or she might have just turned pro, and we were in a pizza hut in Wimbledon, and she was about to play tennis the next day, and we sat opposite her, and she was stuffing her face with pizza like any 16-year-old girl would, and she was then suddenly going, oh no, greasy pizza, I'm going to have pimples tomorrow for on the media interview. <laughs> and and it's just, the, the whole scenario just didn't gel, it was like, She's like worrying about her pimples, but she's going to go and play at Wimbledon. Like, <laughs> how does that work? Where does she come from? What's in her brain? What brought her to this point? Where does she want to go? And then the story comes. So it's it's people for me rather than scenarios. But yeah, at, the, at this point, I can see why yeah, I, I would hear a news story and go, oh, I wonder, 
yeah, you could write a story about that. So a lot of people say news stories, don't they? Or things yes. in the newspaper. Just one scene that then goes from there. Yeah. It's people. Yeah. So not to be like a total downer, but it seems that all of my books seem to come from like the worst parts of my life. Um, and so like how writing is good therapy, right? It's very good. Um, like how to breathe underwater, and it's like I always tell people like like came from the worst summer of my whole life, um, and I wrote this like a year later. And it's about kind of like also like a toxic relationship that I had in high school. And so um, I always seem to go back to like oh my gosh that was the worst thing ever. Like maybe I can twist it and make it into something positive. Um, so I when I write plays, I usually start from something that makes me laugh or something. That I write a lot of I write a lot of angry plays, but that are very funny um, about things that I feel are unjust or wrong. Um, and then this is like straight up autobiographical kind of. So um, so it kind of came from sort of you know not the worst year of my life, but, but yeah, it, was, it was probably the best year. Of my life. <laughs> you got double set of times. I did. <laughs> yeah, same. By the same person. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I hate to be in a bad year with you. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> you won. <laughs> yeah, I think ideas come from everywhere. And when you're a kid too, we're talking about, you know, that summer slide and and keeping kids reading. Writing is also a great way. Because again, it's all about the stories. And writing is a great way to get kids reading, you know? If they're writing their own fan fiction about books that they're reading. I mean, when I was a kid, I would write my own Miss Men. Uh, I love the Miss Men series. Oh, I was Smurfs. Yes, and the Smurfs too. <laughs> the, 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 um, the, the gas stations, the petrol stations in, yeah. in England, they had these little, these little um, ones when you went to fill up and you get these little plastic Smurfs. And I collected nearly all of them. I tell my dad that he had to keep getting gas so I could collect the next one, you know. I love the Smurfs. But yes, you know, reading those, reading the books, reading the stories, and then writing your own versions of them is, is a, a wonderful way to go. So yeah, inspiration comes from everywhere. And one of that I got my idea for this book when I was walking my dog, but one of my ideas for a book which um, hasn't come out yet is um, I got it during gardening, and it's got garden gnomes. So you know they come, they come all over the place, all over the place, and it's so exciting. Gnomes are my favorite thing. Ever. I know mine too. Like I want to be that lady that grows up that has all the gnomes in her front yard, and then at night I'm gonna like move them around <laughs> and make scenes out of like I have this whole plan. Like I want to be that woman. Yeah. I, I, I really I really want this book to come out because I love it. It's, Same. it's a funny like book. It <laughs> it's a really funny book, so it's not like this one is a more serious book and close to my heart in that sense, but yeah. I love notes. They're just so much fun. So much fun. Alright, anybody else have any questions? Any other questions? Cyrus, yes. Can my mom um can my mom talk about the book that's coming this year, the other book that's coming this year? <laughs> <laughs> he's my biggest fan, so he's excited because he helped me write the back cover copy for my next book that's coming out. It's looking like it's going to end up releasing this year in November. It's called Not Innocent, and it's about a group of teens that have to escape an AI-enforced prison. But who do you trust when everyone is guilty? I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, baby. <laughs> I think we have a future author from yeah. over there. Yes. I I want to be a veterinarian. <laughs> oh, that's good. But but you know, veterinarians can be writers too. You know, you can do both. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds like a really great book. And what was the name of it again? It's called Not Innocent. Okay. So for next year's summer slide, there should be. Or for this winter. For this yeah. winter, right? Yes. Exactly. Get it in the winter. Ready. Um, anyone else have any questions? We have a couple more, otherwise I'll go to my lightning round. Lightning round. Lightning round? We've got to vote for the lightning round. Anyone else? Anyone have any other questions? All right, so um, what's the most number of books you guys have read in a year? Starting with you, Vicky. Uh, I think over 100. I think it was like 120. It was like 3. Yeah? Every, Karen? Yeah, about mid-80s. 
So you get, get you get this very popular. So I'm sorry, that's not right. So you get a, a swag bag full of stuff for donating the book. Uh, and so all you have to do is come on over and, and let me have one. And I'll probably let you go in the drawer as well if you buy that book. Sorry, was that go ticket to the zoo? Is that <laughs> Okay, everybody should know this. <laughs> um, so, if you can tell me what swimmer has the most Olympic medals. <laughs> Michael Phelps. <laughs> the level of medals. Congratulations! So come see me. Alright, and then, so that's our time tonight, I think. Um, but if anyone would like it, does anyone have any more questions before we head out? Okay, good. Thank you guys all for being here. Thank you. And um, if you want to come up and um, buy books, have them signed, we can do that now. We have books.